Those, those grilled cheese croutons are so good. You guys, they are mini like grilled cheese sandwiches that we throw on the salad and in our soup. So good. Uh, but yes, as she said, we are, I'm Omari. This is my lovely wife, Abby. That's our daughter, Everett. Uh, and then we are pregnant as well. So we're going to be having another little girl uh, in September. And so we're excited for that. Uh, and um, so we are the founders of Head Hospitality. So under that umbrella of Head Hospitality are our three businesses, uh, Cheddar Box, Pops Lemonade, and Mac House. Yeah. So how, how many of you had been there before to one of those things? Okay. And how many of you haven't? Yeah. I, I got some free Mac coupons for you guys. But all of you get to have them. All of you get to have them. Here we go. Um, and just before we head into the, the rest of this, how we're going to operate today is less like a presentation and more like participation. So we could come with a lot of our own ideas or thoughts of like what we think you want to hear. But what we'd rather do is give you a little bit of backstory into our company, what we do, um, like the core of our company. And then we want to open it up for let's just have a dialogue. Let's answer some questions that you have. Um, so please ask questions, or this is going to be a really short <laughs> uh, thing. But we just want y'all, like, you are in school right now, and we were in school ages ago. And so what might be relevant to you now, maybe we're not going to think about that. So please feel free to ask as many questions loaded or not as you want. So Yeah. All right. So here we go. Awesome. So let's go back. We're going to rewind. Those are actually pictures of Amari and me. Little Orphan Annie, that's me. Preacher man, preacher man. Or she, she calls me a vacuum salesman. Looks like a door-to-door -door vacuum salesman to me. Thanks, babe. I think it's, it's based on the context of how we grew up, you know? Yeah. Um, the preachers that I went to didn't wear three-piece I mean, my mama had me looking good. Uh, but we want to tell you how our entrepreneurship journey started. So during my Little Orphan Annie phase, uh, many of my friends were playing doctor, nurse, mom, teacher, that kind of thing. But I was never interested in that. From the earliest, my earliest memories of play, I wanted to be a shopkeeper. I wanted to be a designer. I wanted to make something with my hands and convince my mom to buy it. I mean, like, I literally was just always into that. My mom was amazing. She let me pull all the, like, groceries that I wanted out of the pantry, put them on her dining room table. Um, I'd even pull out the wax paper, which I, like, saw on the old westerns that my dad watched, but um, and wrap all the, the groceries in that, bag them up, and um, use her old checkbook to check, you know, write, I didn't know what I was writing, but just write money, you know. Um, and my dad had this cool calculator that like printed paper, and so I would run a little tiny shop all by myself on the kitchen, the dining room table, and most of the time my parents didn't come buy anything, but <laughs> it was fun, and that's what I was doing, just always, involved in like when my my imaginative play was always around creating something for other people to experience or to enjoy and then of course make money off of it like that's entrepreneurship um so fast forward a little bit like into um, high school days I decided okay you can offer a product or a service for people and you can make money off of it my parents wouldn't let me um, have like a traditional job so I could focus on my studies which I did not really do but <laughs> they tried <laughs> to encourage me that way um, but I found out okay my friends parents are always talking about their cars are dirty so I said I'll, do, I'll clean your cars. So I started this little miniature auto detailing business. I only charge $25 for like wash, rinse, wax, and arm roll and stuff on the inside. Now I know that I was like, that's why they hired me because it was so cheap. Um, but so I did that for a while and then um, decided I wanted something a little bit more serious. I knew that babysitting was probably something I could do, but I wanted to be more intentional about it. So I created <laughs> basically a resume of sorts, um, did some recon work to find out about some local families that I didn't have relationship with, but I knew they had relationship with people that I knew, um, and basically pitched to them, hey, this is why I should be your child's babysitter. Mailed something, not an email or a text, because that didn't exist when I was, well, I mean, email did, I guess. There, email was there. Texting was not there. Um, but sent that out to them and basically started my own little babysitting thing. Um, and had that gig through high school and college too. Um, and then after that young adult life, I decided to open, like to do a jewelry business, I did an interior design business, all because I wanted to create something that other people could enjoy and also provide like a livelihood for me. 
Yeah, and when I was younger, man, I used to play a lot of athletics. And so, you know, when you play sports, you got to raise money. So I used to get so excited for fundraisers. So, so maybe I was a little bit of a door-to-door salesman. So I would, like, get really hype on selling them little candy bars. Like, like the uh, I don't even know what they were called, like the, the chocolate's finest or something. Man, I would sell so many of those things, win all the prizes. Uh, when I was in middle school, my stepdad he wouldn't just give me money. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, I want a burrito in the cafeteria, not what I have to eat with everybody else. And he's like, well, make some money. I was like, okay. So we went to Sam's. Man, I love Sam's Club, right? We went in, and I saw these caramel apple suckers. Have have any of you had those before? No? Yes? They still make them. Yes, they still make them. He bought me a box of them and said, all right, you want your own money? Go. There you go. He, he just, that's all he gave me. And I went to school, had them in my backpack, and I used to sling them for 50 cent a piece. Made a lot of money. Made a lot of money. After that, I did uh, rubber band bracelets and necklaces. Who does that? Those and I'd were sit actually in class. cool. They were cool hey, at that time. I'm saying I was pretty good. I had this little divider with all the different colors, and I would just tell somebody, hey, pick out your colors. And then during math class, I'd sit there and pay attention and Make them by the end of class, make, make me a little $5 and go on about my day. So we were always hustling, always trying to make money, uh, and just knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I just wanted to create things and didn't know how that would shape up. Yeah. Um, so we're going to fast forward to how we got into entrepreneurship as adults. I grew up with parents who were very um, amazing. They were awesome, and they wanted to make sure we were provided for and secure and all of that. Um, They also really wanted me to pursue something that felt like uh, what they called job security. You might experience this with your parents. You might have conversations like this. Um, So instead, true confession, I did not know the word entrepreneurship probably until I was a young adult. Literally had nobody in my life who talked about entrepreneurship. I had just, I knew people who owned businesses, which is now I understand, but I didn't know that was a thing. So I chose to pursue speech pathology. And so I actually did, um, I went to school for that and then did speech therapy for about 10 years. But right around my 30th birthday, I was remembering, well, let me rewind. Right around my 30th birthday, I had just paid off my student loans because I was really passionate about getting those things gone so I didn't retire with student loans. Um, And so much more was open to me at that point. I didn't have that weight of debt anymore and I just felt like, I could do whatever I want. I was single, I was about to turn 30, I was a healthy person, you know, like I had, it felt like the world is your oyster. And so I remembered back to childhood and how I wanted to create something for people to enjoy that also provided for me financially. Yeah, so a friend of mine told me about this grilled cheese truck in Nashville. I don't know if any of y'all are from Tennessee, anybody? Nope, okay. Um, It's called the Grilled Cheesery. I've actually never been there, but I remember hearing the concept and being like, people pay money for grilled cheese sandwiches, not at Sonic. (laughs) Like That's my only grid for somewhere that sold a grilled cheese. And so I started asking people in my spheres of influence and then also some other people around town, um, just what do you think about a grilled cheese business? Do you think anybody would be interested in that? Then I learned, I discovered that um, locally we had amazing bread bakers and an artisan cheese maker out like in Golson area. I don't know if you've ever been to Homestead Heritage. Nope, okay. Um, It's a cool place, you should go. It's really educational, they make a lot of their own stuff. Um, But I found out that they make their own cheese and they age it in this underground cheese cave and it was like all this cool stuff was right here in Waco. So I, decided let's do it you know I was driving down the road one day and the name cheddar box popped into my head and I like laughed out loud it's like huh that sounds like a grilled cheese sandwich and that's where it was born literally in my car um and yeah so I um decided to I wanted to pursue uh something that was a low risk opportunity uh, being debt free at that point well still but I had just paid off my student loan, so I did not want to take out any debt. I didn't want to owe money to anybody. I wanted to be able to just walk away if I decided I didn't want to do it or if it flopped. So I found a low-risk opportunity at the Waco Downtown Farmer's Market and decided to open a grilled cheese stand, and I did, and worked a full-time job while I did that on the weekends. And it was really successful. 
Um, didn't pay myself at all that whole year because I, for, I had a full-time job. And I knew that those funds, if I wanted to grow the business, I knew that I was going to need them for later. So like the latest iPhone or a new, let's be honest, I'm not into Gucci or any of that stuff. <laughs> like any of those, like anything that's like, seems like, ooh, I have $1,000, I'm going to buy fill in the blank. I just sat on it instead of like pursuing my like in the moment wants. I knew that there was more in the future. So once we got to a year, I'd saved up all the money that we had made, like our profit for the year at the farmer's market. We were only open four hours a week. That was it. <laughs> and um, ended up getting an opportunity to cater one of the fixer upper episodes, like their reveal days, and got connected um, with Magnolia and the Gaineses and then was invited to open a food truck at Magnolia, which was awesome. That was September, like the beginning of September, and they were opening at the end of October, <laughs> and I did not have a food truck, but I had $11,000 that I had saved up, and I was like, we can do this. <laughs> so I started, I went to the health department, they told me I couldn't do it, I said, yes, I can. <laughs> like, I was determined to hit this goal, and so I quit my job, I bought an old Mexican taqueria, for $8,000, I spent the rest of the money to flip it into a not circus looking thing. <laughs> it was red, had lights all over. It was, it, I wish I had brought, it looked like a circus. Um, like a circus, a carnival. Uh, Y'all know what I'm talking about. Like okay. A concession trailer. Yeah, yeah. It definitely was not fancy, but flipped it. And then by October 25th, opened at the silos with literally no experience running a business. I had done no research <laughs> on how, the, how to actually do it, um, but I wanted to do it and I did it. And I, that was 2015, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you did it. Uh, so for me, it was a little bit different. So once again, I knew that I wanted to do something in like business or whatever, but I, I didn't do that. I did athletic training. So I went to school in Kansas, I was an athletic trainer. Uh, really love that. I thought I'd do that for the rest of my life. Uh, got to work for the Seattle Seahawks for just a little bit, which was so fun, a great experience. Uh, worked in student affairs after that, so I worked at my college as a resident hall director. I was a coordinator of student activity. So I did a lot of different things, um, but man, I knew my calling was to be a preacher. So uh, I ended up coming to Baylor to go to seminary at Truett. I got my Master of Divinity there. Uh, worked at a local church here for 10 years as a college pastor. So really love that. College pastor and a worship leader. Did that for 10 years and actually met her at her food truck at Magnolia. I was in line. I came up to the line. This woman was like, can I take your order? I was like, ooh, yes. I did not talk All like right? that. I was like, can I get a boss? You know, didn't know she was the boss, you know, but uh, I got the boss sandwich. And man, she was just so nice to me, y'all. I'm talking about fellas, all right. When a girl is really, really nice to you, you like, oh man, I got a chance, right, right? That's how I felt. I was like, man, she's into me, she's into me. And so that's a longer story. We can talk after that about all that, but. Tell you the truth about the moment. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell you the truth later, but. Yes, yes, but anyway, um, so met at the food truck in line. Uh, then a few months later, I, I guess, I don't know, six months later? Eight months later, anyway, we, we got married. Uh, started dating, got married, uh, and actually on our honeymoon, we launched our first business together. It was a little drink stand that was like right next to our food truck at, at Magnolia called, called Drink. And so that was fun. And the crazy part about it is that I always knew I'd own my own business, and I secretly knew I'd own a food truck, but I was like, how am I going to own a food truck? Leading worship, preaching at church, doing these other things. That, that wasn't anywhere in my mind. Like, I was like, I have no idea how I was going to accomplish any of that. But then I met her, and she was running a truck with my favorite food, cheese. Come on, how many cheese lovers? Yeah, all right. And so I was like, man, Lord, this is awesome. And so then we had that. Then we did our drink stand. Uh, and then we were thinking through, let, let, let me put a timeline up here. Um, we were thinking through, she had a ton of local support when she was at the farmer's market. I, I mean, locals would come out. I remember going to the farmer's market back in the day, seeing her working, going, oh, she's kind of cute. You know, and I just keep going, I, I didn't buy a grilled cheese because uh, her line was way too long. It was ridiculous. Um, but she had such a local following. We wanted that local following to continue with us. And so she thought having this food truck at Magnolia, all the locals would just go down to Magnolia. Well, locals don't go to Magnolia. 
And so that didn't work. And so once again, she was driving and heard the name Mac House. And so through uh, just a time of prayer and us discussing it and um, we came up with Mac House, Franklin Avenue Mac House. And as we were doing kind of our menu development for that, uh, we wanted to be all about comfort eats. Those comfort foods are things that make you all excited inside when you have them. And so when we start talking about beverages, you know, we wanted um, everything we do to be very simple. So somebody can just come up. It's an approachable menu. It's a simple menu. We don't want to give you a ton of different options. But what we offer you, we want it to be the best of the best. Uh, and so, of course, we're in Texas. Got to have some sweet tea on the menu. And then for me, uh, like my comfort beverage is lemonade, my dad's lemonade. Uh, my dad taught me this lemonade recipe when I was 10 years old. I remember we were in the kitchen together, and he was teaching it to me. And he was like, now, now son, this is the best lemonade you ever going to have. And I'm like, yeah, right, dude. And I had it, and I was like, oh, my gosh. How did you do this, you know? And then loved it. And so I was like, Abby, I got it. We're going to do tea and lemonade. And she was like, I'm not really a lemonade fan. I was like, well, you ain't had this lemonade. Watch this. I whip it up for her, give her a try. And she's like, Eh, that's not bad. I'm like, you are crazy. Like, this is the best thing ever. So anyway, she did admit that it was better than any other lemonade she ever had, but we just needed to work together on it a little bit uh, so that it was more, more approachable for her, too. Because what we realized is that black people, we like it very, very sweet, and white people kind of like it a little tart. More tart. Yeah, so we wanted to meet right in the middle and do the best of both worlds. So how many of you have had Pops? And... Oh, okay, that's awesome. Thank y'all. Um, and have you noticed that it's kind of the best of both worlds? It's like, I got that tart, but I still got that sweet. But then at the very end, it's just like, oh, it hit me right here. That's all her. She was like, it needs to be a little more tart. I'm like, we need more sugar, you know? Anyway, so we decided to come up with uh, that lemonade for Mac House. And you, you guys, it was a hit. Like, Mac House was going well, but then we just saw people coming through line, and they would just get lemonade. And so I was like, man. Like, something's going on here. Um, and so I asked her, I, I, con tr true confession, I have a lot of student loan debt. And, uh, man, we are debt-free people. That's where we strive to be always. We have debt-free business, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, and so I was like, I want to do something to get rid of this school debt. So I said, hey, can I bottle this lemonade and sell it at Magnolia? Because we have thousands of people coming there every single day. And she said, yeah, as long as you do it all by yourself. And I said, thanks for the support, babe. And so I started bottling this lemonade, selling it at, uh, at Cheddar Box. And you guys, we could not keep it stocked. I mean, it was like, it was like a competition between me and the Lord. I was like, I'm going to make 200 bottles today. I was like, all right, cool. We'd sell out in like four hours. And I'm like, I'm going to make 300 bottles today. We'd sell out in like three hours. I'm like, what is happening? Uh, and so we realized, man, something was on this product. So we decided to make it a real deal. So we named it Pops. It, that was our first truck. Now we have a trailer, and we have another truck that's going to be coming out soon, too. So, yeah, those are the three businesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a little backstory on us. Now, we, we want to just, this is really important to us. And I, admittedly, when I first started Cheddarbox, it really wasn't until we, to get, we got together and we founded mm -hmm. Head Hospitality that we took time to create a company core. Right. That's what we call it. I don't really know in school right now what you call it, but um, that's what we call it at Head Hospitality. But um, I just want to acknowledge that this takes some time to do yeah. to create, like, what do you want the core of your business to be? But it is so crucial yes. to, like, creating a consistent work culture and um, customer experience that you have a core that's very clear so your staff and your your customers know how you operate. Because our customers, they hold us accountable, maybe not even knowing that they're doing it. Um, when just different interactions that happen, we're like, oh yeah, you know what? We give no less than our best. That mac and cheese, I wouldn't want to eat that either. Let me redo that for you, you know. Um, so I'm just going to go through this. I'm going to hit a couple of things. Yeah, and let me say quickly, yeah. this was a fluid document for us, meaning that like it, it underwent a lot of changes. So what our purpose and values are now, if you would have asked us maybe a year ago, they have been tweaked. Like, and so this is something we're always looking back to going, like, is this who we are? Is this who we want to be? And is this communicating it? Um, the way that we need it to so that our staff and our customers understand who we are. Yeah. 
And something that kind of held me back from ever sitting down to do this is I, I don't know if you know much about the Enneagram. I'm not sure. I feel like y'all probably know a lot more than people my age do. Um, but the Enneagram, like, I identify with being that one personality type where I want it to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, I'm like, I'm not ready to le- release it to the world. And so I struggled. I didn't want to put anything on our company and expect our team to, like, fall within this certain company core without it being perfect, but it it just got to a point where it's like, you know what, we're just going to go with what we know right now. It's just like we grow as we go. It's like one of our our fourth core value, but we're just going to do it. We're going to put this out there and we're going to tweak it along the way and we'll invite our team to to tweak with us, you know, and they really did do um, really well to do that. So that's just an encouragement. I feel like if any of you are ones out there and you want things to be perfect before you try it, I've learned that it's really powerful for you in that perfection state to actually try something that's not perfect. And if it's if it needs to be fixed or it flops, that's okay. Like it's good for your well, in here. I don't know what to call that, but it's just good for you if you have that personality. Um, okay, so our purpose at Head Hospitality, like I'm already said, we have Cheddarbox, Mac House, and Pops. Um, and any for. For all of those companies, this is our company core, and anything that we create for the future, this will be the same. We want to create an atmosphere and product that customers love, and also a work culture where every team member thrives. So, yeah, well, that it speaks for itself. That is what it is. Um, we achieve this purpose through our four core values. So we're approachable, we are generous, we give no less than our best, and we grow as we go. And then our business philosophy is we always want to profit with a purpose. As much as entrepreneurship is about money, you know, you like make money, it's also for us, maybe not everyone, but it's about people and moving things forward that are not just your own personal gain. Um, And so um, a couple things I want to hit, we've mentioned it twice, (laughs) but um, it really attaches to the we are generous and we profit with a purpose. Since day one, we have never taken out a traditional business loan. We have always been committed to we will do what we can do right now so that we have control over our money and our financial stability as a company because if everything hits the fan or we just say, we're done, I want to be able, we both want to, be able to walk away and not have this looming debt that we either have to pay off or we have to file bankruptcy. I'm not trying to live that life. Some people, that is great for them. And that's something that you get to decide as you pursue starting a business. You choose what's best for you. So I'm not saying that debt is bad. Don't hear that. For us, debt-free business has has enabled us to be successful and sleep at night at the same time. So Especially through like a pandemic, you know, when we didn't have to make payments to a bank or anyone else um, because it was our hours that was that was a good thing for yeah. us yeah and Let's be healthy with within the pandemic we did need to receive some of the like ppp funding from the federal government which was like a miracle in itself um and i can't imagine people who had no savings what they did i just don't know how they made it um because we had ppp plus the savings account that we had like racked up Unfortunately, it kind of depleted a lot of our resources for future growth, but that's okay. We're all going to make it through this pandemic because money will continue to come in. Um, But so the way that attaches for us to we are generous and we profit with a purpose, when we're in control of like the finances that we have and we're not like, oh, okay, this money comes in, but like all this money goes out and there's like barely any left except to pay ourselves and then that's it. Um, We are able to be generous with what we have and what we feel like God has given us as a business. And so one of the things we're really proud, well, we're passionate about eradicating student loan debt because we know that our our country in particular has a, (laughs) a pattern of inviting students that are young and just learning how to be adults. We invite you in to take as much money as you need to fulfill your college dreams without preparing you for how you're gonna pay that back. So we feel really passionate because both of us kind of experienced that in our younger years with our parents not being able to give us the right training um, for that. But 
So since we feel so passionate about this, us being in control of our money and not having debt, we've been able to give, we have this student loan repayment program within our company, and over $40,000 at this point to help, um, in a couple of years. years, yeah, to help our people get out of debt. So one of the girls is like completely debt free now. Well, two, two of the people are. Yeah, anyway. people. And then we still have a couple of people we're working towards, do, you know, like, helping them pay it off. It's a collaborative effort, but we're really proud of that and we know that like for us, having a debt-free business model has allowed us to do that. Um, so I think that's where I'm gonna end on that. Um, I won't go through all those because y'all are smart and you can <laughs> interpret what those others really mean, but I just like to share that part of our story. What's next? Oh yeah, that's it. So at this point, we want you to feel free, ask any questions, Ask whatever you think about, whatever you want. Nothing's off the table. And if you ask something a little too personal, we'll just redirect it and answer something else. You want me to answer that? Yeah. Pops, 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 pops. <laughs> Beverages. Beverages. Great industry good, to man. go into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the reason is they're simpler to make and they require less ingredients. But have, how many of you have bought a $6 latte recently? Anybody? Common ground, Starbucks, you know. But we, our culture pays for it. You've charged $10 for a mac and cheese, and people are like, well, I don't know. It's just mac and cheese, but I'll pay $6 for a latte. I don't understand the mentality behind it, but it's true. So if you were thinking about a, a, an entrepreneurial yeah, beverage endeavor, beverages are a great way to go. So for perspective, Mac House, all of our businesses are profitable, but we made... I don't remember the actual number, but I know that we made less at Pops f last year, and we we pulled more profit from Pops than we did like Mac House. Because cheese is expensive. Cheese is very yeah. expensive. Yeah. I'm gonna let you answer, but I need to know: did, Have y'all in any of your classes talked about predictive index or culture index? So it, it's basically a way to help you understand how you're going to navigate in a, this is my like really bad like explanation, but how you operate within like a professional setting in your work environment. So Amari Test is a rainmaker. Uh, <laughs> just, it sounds, it is what it sounds like. He has an uncanny ability, there's that word, uncanny, um, ability to in the most healthy and positive way possible, convince people to do what he wants. <laughs> like, like follow that his, really bad. <laughs> not manipulative, he just has, like people yeah. want to do what he, he pitches. So yeah. that's what I'll say about that, and then I want you to tell us. Yeah, um, I, I think that was built on relationship. Um, since I went to, so when I came here to go to, um, to, go to Truett, um, I had a graduate assistantship in multicultural affairs, so I got to work with student life staff and all that team for a few years. I was a resident chaplain on campus, so I was very connected during my four years um, at Truett, um, and then stayed connected because I'm also a mentor um, within like the religion department as well. So it's just connection. Um, and so when they decided, hey, we, we want to start um, having food trucks come on board on campus, they, they just gave us a call. Um, and luckily, I knew all the people involved with it, and so they gave us a shot. And, um, and then the reason why we get to stay here so long is because I just asked. You know, like, you guys, man, my mom tells me all the time, you have not because you ask not. You know, and I'm like, yeah, whatever, mom. She's like, it's scripture. I'm like, no, it's not. I looked it up. It's scripture. It's in James, y'all. I, I, I know. I was a pastor. I, that, was, that was in my younger days, right? Um, but that, that, was the, that, was the, that was the truth. I asked them. I, I said, hey, we love being here. We know this is our target market, you know, because we've been to a lot of places in town, and we love being on campus. And so I said, I'd like to just stay for the rest, of the rest of the semester, rest of the year. Let me stay forever. And they said, well, let us look at the schedule. So they looked at the schedule, and they gave me the schedule and said, any day where there's not already three trucks, you can be a truck. Well, there was only one week, I think, in that semester where I had to pull my truck off. And then I said, I'll, I'll take all the other dates. And they said, really? I said, yes. 
So we came on campus, did, did a whole semester. So then that next semester, they said, do you want to just come for another whole semester? I said, yes. I was like, and are you working on me a permanent place? Because that's where I'd like to be. And so hopefully that's the next step, is that we'll have a couple POPs locations on campus. That's what I'm working yeah. on. Who's the person they need to email to like request that? Yeah, Matt? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to put them out there like that. But just tell everybody, like, we want POPs. Get POPs on campus. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. I think before, like pre-pandemic, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, but it was definitely working. <laughs> Things were working. And now that um, the pandemic has created such a supply chain, inflation, blah, blah, blah all that stuff, it's created such um, a, a challenge or an opportunity for you to reshape your business model. Um, we, we're actually currently looking at, okay, so at what point does, it, does a customer max out at what they will spend on a grilled cheese sandwich, on a cup of lemonade, on a mac and cheese? Um, so I, don't, I wouldn't say that we've ever been in a place where we're like, I don't think this is going to work. It's more of being in a place of, do we want to keep doing things the way we're doing them? Because although it's working, is it really fulfilling Oh, that's not anymore. Is it really like hitting our company core and creating a work culture where everyone thrives and you know our customers get with like the best? Um, because prices are just constantly increasing, like literally. We we buy I don't know 200 to 300 pounds of cheese a week, and our cheese prices change every month or two. Um, so to keep up with that is a challenge. So we haven't had it yet, but we're kind of in the middle of those hard questions now, you know? Yeah, and I think that we haven't had as many of those experiences because we invite a lot of people into our process. Uh, Abby and I are both a, um, a part of like a round table of entrepreneurs, so, so she has her round table, I have my round table. Um, and so we can go to that group with questions and, you know, is this a good idea? We also have a lot of friends that are in business that we really confide in. And so um, just getting more eyes on what you're doing really helps um, so that maybe failure gets to be pushed back a little bit further because um, we really do our due, dil our due diligence um, to kind of think things through really well with other people, with community, to make sure that what we put out is going to be something that's, that's going to be good. Yeah, good question. What other questions do you have? Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that was for. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just laughing because of a conversation we had yesterday. Yes, um, yes, yes. But I would say that I have known a handful of people that work well together, um, like married couples who work well together in business. Um, the majority of people that I've known prefer it separate. I don't know what the trick is, but I know that Omari and I our personalities just mesh well. We're so similar in so many ways and so different in the ways that affect business. And so I tend to be more of the like numbers, vision. I mean, my title technically is CEO, and we don't have a title for him yet. We're working on it. But I, I, don't need a I title. call him our chief no business title. development officer. I don't even officer. have a title, y'all. <laughs> yeah. This is all very new. Like the titles are very new, and they don't really mean that much. I just take care of the like finances, vision, back this side of things. Um, and he's more of like the face of the company, which is great, because I like that better. Um, so we work well together, but even in the working well together right now, I would say the like buzzword for me is schedules. So before, it was difficult and like to get on the same page with all this stuff. And then we had a baby. And the baby doesn't care what our schedules are. And she's amazing and wonderful. And we want to spend time with her. And so we write, like, currently it's like 
a jigsaw puzzle to get all the scheduling together. And that is a challenge. And at the end of the day, like I literally had a thought while I was standing here and he's talking, I love working with this guy. Like I love being up here with him. I wish we could just do this all the time and not have to deal with employees or <laughs> like stressful things of business. I don't know. Um, I don't know that really answers the question. We have challenges for sure. Uh, but we also are just very honest with one another too. So it's like, we're, we don't take jabs at each other. We're not um, passive aggressive. We're just like, hey, this is hard. We need to fix this. Something needs to change. Um, and I think that's helped. And we're both generally happy people too. So that helps. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that there's like a magic recipe for it, working with your it spouse. It just works, <laughs> yeah, it just works. So. One thing I know that we get feedback all the time at Mac House, and it's really, really important to us, it goes back to that approachable piece, like we are approachable. Um, so we are, we are as concerned about their experience with the product as we are about their experience with our team and our business and everything we offer. So I really do think we have like consistent people who return all the time. Um, our staff, we've, we've trained them this way. Uh, that sounded really weird. We have... <laughs> But we've empowered our whole team um, to operate in, in the mentality of like, every customer who comes through that window, comes to the window, comes to the drive-thru, like, act like you, like you already know them. Like, you may not already know them, but for us, the familiarity piece and the um, remembering people's names and making intentional conversation when you have a minute and really not like keeping the mindset that like every customer who comes through is actually the person paying your paycheck, not me. I just write the checks, but the people coming put the money in the bank, you know? Um, and so I think that approachable environment is what I've seen, because that's the feedback we get most often from customers. It's like, man, your team is just so nice. Like they are so encouraging and I always feel better when I leave. And that's what we've always, um, strived for and our team does a really great job of doing that. Yeah, and 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 that truly is probably what brings people back. Like we are we love food and beverages, but we're about hospitality. We want to take care of people. We want to love people well. Um, and it just so happens that we feel like we can do that best through feeding people. You know, like somebody invites you into their home, and they sit you at their table and they feed you and they serve you. Um, that is hospitality for us. And so we do think that that's what helps bring people back. But there, there are a couple practicals. So we have um, like a square online system. And so Abby sends out newsletters from time to time and that goes to our customer base. And those might have coupons or specials and things like that um, that would help our customers to come back. And so we do have those practicals. But for us, it's man, if we can just be hospitable, like if we can be have an approachable menu um, if we can have approachable people, you know, and if we can have an excellent product every single time, people will come back. We won't have to worry about that. But let's, let's, let's thank them anyway by sending them coupons and stuff like that to, to kind of help a little bit. Hospitality. hospitality company yeah because yeah. everything we do like I think our main motivator is about how customers feel when they're there and when they leave it's the food is just the like medium that we use to get you to have a great experience we it's really about like hosting people right like we're even thinking about the future like how can we create spaces for other entrepreneurs that are food businesses to come in um, and have a space. So how can we create a hospitable space for others to profit from it too? Um, so that, that is truly our heart. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I mean, I think that we have, we have operated debt-free up to this point, and we 
just like our core value, we grow as we go. We're not prideful enough to say we would never do fill in the blank. Um, anything I've ever said I would never do, I ended up doing. I mean, it's like, you know, like you just, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. But like we, um, we will just, every financial step that we take as a business will be calculated and the risks will be weighed before doing it. You know, we've just, we've, in the industry, we have chosen, <laughs> I actually kind of chose us, we both just love hospitality. Yeah. Um, but in this industry, we know it's like the number one industry to tank fast. Like if you start a business, most restaurants don't make it past year one, much less, they say if you make it to year five, you probably have a good run, but even still, pandemic happens and you're kind of <laughs> left at the mercy of that. Um, so whatever we do would be calculated. And when we, th I think, when we think about what we really want to do next, it's big. <laughs> and so I think it will require Partnership. partnerships, investors, maybe some debt. But what I feel like we have um, one positive for our track record with our finances is that we have banks calling us, asking us to finance through them because we have a proven track record of responsibility with money and we're not as high of a risk for them. So. Yeah, and, and if we take on debt, we just want it to be smart debt. You know, we, we want to do it for the right reason. So we just purchased our building that our commissary kitchen is in. But it also has three other t tenants in the building. So that was a good purchase for us, but we had to take on debt to be able to purchase that. But it's been a benefit for us and a benefit for our, our business so far. And to clarify, too, that can be confusing because I said we're debt-free. I'm talking about traditional business loans. Like, we haven't taken out money to do our business. The, and the building is actually owned under a different company, not Head Hospitality. But, um, but that is a, an investment property because we're going to keep it even if we're not in it. Yeah. And it's already provided income, like generated income for us because we have other tenants and stuff there. But. It's a great question. It's a good question I ask myself all the time. At what point are you going to be willing to take the plunge? So. Thank you all so much. This is awesome.